yeah, I suppose I'm going to jump straight in and explain what an octary is and why you might want to make one. So an octary is... Rather, an octary and a quadtree are both ways of dividing up space based on the objects which kind of exist in that space. Now, this may sound kind of abstract and vague right now, but I promise you it will get more concrete and specific and it will all make sense like why you'd want to do this. So this is a little diagram of what uh, a quad tree looks like. Uh, so you have a kind of area, a space, and in a video game this may represent the world or the screen or the play area, whatever that, whatever that is, wherever you're interested in kind of tracking the positions of objects and stuff. And what uh, quad tree in this case does is it divides the space into four kind of segments like this. So like a top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. Um, and then, so okay, so if you look at this top left section here, we can see there's one object in here, object A, and down in this bottom left one there's an object B, and that's just fine. But when there are more than one or more than some threshold of objects in a segment, we then divide that segment again. So you can see how this top right segment has been then divided again into four, until you end up with only one object uh, in each segment. It's not always one, like that's a number which you can tweak. But you basically keep dividing this space into four. You can see here there ended up with two objects in this kind of top left segment. And so it was divided yet again until there's a small enough kind of number of objects in each segment. Uh, if you look at this little GIF um, on our tweet, you can see this is something similar but in 3D. So this is called a quad tree because space is divided into four sections, so quad meaning four, and then it's potentially subdivided again and again and again, kind of recursively creating this kind of spatial tree structure. Uh, if you do the same thing in three dimensions, you now have to divide space into eight sections, right? So you have like a four on the top here of this big cube and then four on the bottom, and then you can see where there are more objects, we end up dividing the space again and again until um, there's a low enough kind of objects in this space. What you can also see in this GIF is that objects which are touching are being highlighted in red. And this is probably the primary practical use of these things, which is that it allows you very, very efficiently to find objects which are nearby to other objects. So if we start trying to sketch this out, imagine we have uh, a world like this. And we have some kind of set of objects in this world. Okay, let's call it A. See over here. See over here. See over here. Then, if we want to find out, for example, if A is touching any other objects, really the most straightforward way to do this is to check every other object in the world and compare its position to A. Basically measure, okay, this object C, like how far is this? Is it close enough that we consider them touching? If it is, then we do whatever we need to do if they're touching, like color them red or have them bounce off each other or whatever else it may be. And if not, then we kind of just ignore that pair of objects and move on to the next one. Then we have A and B. We would compare that distance and check if they're close enough, and if not, you know, we would ignore them. If they are, we would do whatever we want to do, color them red or whatever it is. Then we would check this combination. And this works just fine, right? Fundamentally, fundamentally, sorry, computers can't do what a human would do, which is just kind of look at this, take it all in at once, and be able to just notice that A and C are kind of close together, but A and B or A and D are far away. Computers fundamentally can't really do that. They have to kind of methodically go through everything and, you know, check the recorded position of A and B and C and D and sort of compare them all individually. Which works fine if you've got just four objects, but if you had a thousand objects here, you'd basically need to check every object against every other object and then straight away you're checking on the order of like a million different pairs of objects against each other. So this straightforward approach of um, checking every object against every other object doesn't really scale very well, right? So if you double the number of objects, you quadruple the number of checks you have to do, essentially. So if you were to draw a graph, perhaps, of like how much time you have to spend or how many comparisons you have to do against the like number of objects, 
and then it would kind of go into a crazy hockey stick kind of thing like that and it would quickly get like un unmanageable so if instead we use this kind of quadratory approach then maybe we would divide these things up into four and then maybe we would say oh you know what these are uh, there are two objects here let's kind of break that down I made a mistake by drawing C almost right in the center and straight away we can kind of exclude anything which is in a different box so if we're checking A we kind of only need to check its its immediate vicinity uh, I know potentially like neighboring to boxes there's you know there's a bit of fiddliness to do with objects which might like you know cross a boundary between one and the other but there are ways to deal with that that's kind of a minor practical issue but fundamentally it allows us to narrow down things we want to check very easily so you know even if we built a quad tree which is quite happy for there to be as many as two objects in one section then it would mean we could we'd only have to check these things against each other and we'd only have to do the like expensive work of actually calculating this distance for this one pair and we wouldn't bother checking b against d or a against d or c against d or any of those other combinations because this kind of structure we've built allows us to rule out a whole load of these things which are you know too far away from each other for us to care about so i like to call this like a spatial index um because that's kind of what it does right it's a way of like being able to look up things in a neighborhood or things which are close to each other and ask questions like you know give me all objects which are within like this box right okay maybe in this example there's nothing there but a quad tree kind of allows us to do that in a, in a more efficient way that's probably a bad example i should have done something like this right let's add a couple more objects here so maybe this got split like this and this one got split kind of like we had it before then if we want to check for all of the objects inside this rectangle here we only kind of need to check the sections of the of the uh, quad tree which it overlaps with which again makes that way more efficient so this is used in games for any kind of like physics or collision detection or you know if these objects wanted to have a gravitational pull on each other you could use this to find objects like nearby to a planet which you then want to apply gravity to in fact several of the other um projects we've done on these streams could have benefited from something like this so actually let me pull up a couple of the gifs we made of those things because maybe that will kind of help to illustrate so okay yeah so here's one project we did which was this um flocking behavior and the way this worked was that every bird needs to be able to check to see nearby birds and that will affect kind of how they fly around and this yellow circle kind of represents the nearby birds which would affect this sort of one bird in particular which we're following here and if we'd have used something like a quad tree here then we would have been able to very very efficiently say hey give me all birds within this radius uh, and that would be like a super efficient thing to do uh, another example would be this solar system simulation thing we made where objects which are nearby kind of have a gravitational pull on each other and we could maybe use could have used this kind of quadri structure to rule out objects which are way too far away from each other to have any influence um yeah which meant if we had thousands of objects flying around it would be many many times more efficient to do that way yeah so this is a very neat structure i think i think that's a pretty cool thing and it also is something you can visualize in a in a fairly neat way um yeah another thing i should mention is that you always divide like perfectly evenly like you always split like perfectly into four if it's a 2d thing or if it's 3d you split perfectly into eight. Oh god i'm gonna try and draw something 3d this is probably a mistake <laughs> but if it's a 3d game then your world is kind of a 3d space and you would split kind of into eight like sub 
cubes kind of like that. Does this work? Hopefully there are no artists watching. <laughs> okay, hopefully that makes sense. You kind of split it into a like a two by two Rubik's cube kind of shape. There are other similar things to this. You may have heard of like BSP, like binary space partitioning and other methods of doing this, which work similarly, but maybe they have different rules about how exactly you divide the space up. Like maybe it's not always divided up 100% evenly. Um, yeah. But in this really simple case, um, we always split evenly into four or evenly into eight like this. You know, and then this cube, if there are a load of enough objects in there, it may have got split itself, you know, into smaller kind of sub cubes, kind of like this. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, we're going to start making this thing, and the good thing about these is they're pretty nice and easy to visualize. So the tool I'm using for this is called processing. This is a something we've used in like 90% of these streams. It's a nice framework for game development and graphics and sort of, um, what do they call it, like creative programming, like procedural visual stuff. I like it because it's very to the point and quick and easy to get stuff drawn on screen. So let's have a think about what we want to do here. So if I want to implement something like our little example, then we probably need at the very least a list of all of the objects in our world, right? Um, processing has a handy class called pvector, which stores like an XYZ coordinate of something. So I'm going to create an empty list here. Uh, and the processing lets you define two main functions. Like the first one is called setup, and it runs that once at the start of the program. And there's, non there's another one called draw, which it runs like every frame of animation, basically. So what I want to do in setup here is I'm just going to... Actually, the first thing you need to do is define the size of a window. So let's try like 800 by 800. And then I'm going to put processing in 3D mode because we're going to start with a 2D quad tree, but ultimately we're going to turn this into a 3D octree. And then I think what I'll do is I'll just put some random um, points kind of into this thing. So how many points do we want? By the way, if I'm going too fast or something doesn't make sense, please please feel free to like drop a question in the chat and I'm more than happy to go down any tangents and explain this stuff in more detail. But let's put let's be ambitious and put 100. And what I'm going to do is try and generate a, a random point for each one of here, these. So points have x, y, and z. Actually, let me get out the processing reference to see what random functions they give us. Um, okay, so there's a random function where you can pass in a range. This is almost certainly too small for you to read. Okay. So our world was like 800 by 800 units, so actually I'm going to make some kind of constants up here for that. Um, let's say world width is going to be 400. So we want a random number from, if the world is kind of centered on the zero, zero point, which probably makes sense here, then it's actually going to go from like minus 400 up to 400 in this case. So, and similarly for kind of this axis. So I think what I'm going to do is just say 
minus world width over two to world width over two. So that's the x coordinate. The y coordinate is going to be the same, but with height. Uh, since we're starting 2D for now, I'm going to just give these the z coordinate of zero. So we've generated our random point. Then I'm just going to add that into our list of objects. So now we should have a load of objects here. So now let's try and draw something. So to begin with, I'm just going to start with a black background. And then I'm just going to draw every object kind of like this. Capitalization is important because computers are pedantic assholes. Luckily, I am too, so we get along relatively well. Um. Okay, how am I going to draw these? Um. Does it let me draw a point? If I. Hmm. I'm debating do I draw them as a little sphere, which will be nice once we extend to three dimensions, or can I make like a point? Oh, let's do a sphere if we can. So, what parameters do we put into drawing a sphere? Okay, interestingly, a sphere, it won't let us give it a position as a parameter. We just kind of supply the radius, but we have to kind of use this translate command to uh, move our cursor, if you like, to the right position before we draw it. So I'm going to use these handy functions, which I'll explain shortly. Dead. Then we draw a sphere. Let's give it a radius of five for now. Can okay, I check this works? And then I'm going to explain what the heck this matrix stuff relates to. Okay, I'm getting this annoying error, which is one of the most annoying things about processing. Which is, for some reason, it won't let you refer to variables in this size thing. Um, and I have to put kind of raw numbers in there, which is really, really annoying if I'm honest. I think I may actually just give it a bit of a bigger size so we can kind of see the borders of this box as well. Um, okay, I cannot see anything. Let's take a look. I wonder if it's to do with our kind of camera position. Actually, you know what? I'm going to use a little plugin for processing, which gives us a nice, convenient, like draggable mouse camera thing. So we can like pan and move our view around because it will make this whole thing a lot easier rather than trying to code that in myself. So I think. How do I do this? Import library, PZCam. Let me Google how PZCam works. Um. This is really old. I feel like this may be an old version. So let's go to Google it again. How does this work? So we define a camera, we put some parameters in, and then everything should kind of just work. Okay, awesome. I 
generally avoid using libraries in these projects, but this feels like something which would actually take a while to implement and actually would be genuinely kind of useful. I think the next parameter is the distance away. It should start. Um, yeah, what are these parameters here? Distance. Okay. So it's kind of set initially to look at like the zero 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 point and kind of pull back a certain distance. The issue here is that if we have our world, then kind of by default the camera sort of starts right in the middle of the world here. But we kind of want to pull it back so that it's looking at our whole little scene here, like from a reasonable distance. So let's use the world width as a distance. Does that work for us? Let's see. I cannot see anything. Maybe our spheres are the wrong color or something like that. I don't do a huge amount of 3D stuff actually with processing, so a little bit rusty there. Could be a lighting thing. Okay. Yeah, once you get into 3D, you have to start creating lights and other stuff, so very often at the start of a project involving 3D, you'll end up with nothing visible on screen and it can be very kind of confusing. Okay, so here we're seeing kind of what we expected, which is uh, these objects being like randomly placed in a square. And then there they are, there's all the little blobbies. So they are randomly placed appropriately, it seems. So now we need to start messing around with our quadri thing. In fact, I'm going to screenshot this and then we can start sketching on top of it because I think it may help to illustrate some points here. So let me print screen that. Nothing super secret on my second screen there, but in any case, okay. So we've got this little virtual world we've managed to create. Um, the actual bounds of the 800 by 800 thing are more like this, probably. Oh, why can't I see this? That's so weird. Add another layer. Okay. The actual boundary of our world is probably more like this. Uh, I know what we do is we kind of repeatedly divide this thing up. So until we, we end up with little blocks with only either one object in it or some parameter we set for like the maximum. That's kind of a tunable thing which you can play around with as like an option. But there's clearly still loads of these. Let's keep dividing until there are like three things in each area. That's right on the line, so. Uh, let's focus on this top left bit and kind of assume we do something similar down here. So this already has three in it, so this is all good. So this is done, this is finished, subdividing here. This one has more than three, so we need to divide again. Now we've got like one, two, one, two, three, one. I think that's okay. This one has three, so this is all good. This one probably needs to be divided again. And then this one still has several in it, so that probably gets divided again. Okay, so hopefully follow the basic logic of what we want to do here. It's basically define our kind of space and then keep dividing it up until there are less than three in this example, like objects in each thing. If there are more, we just need to divide again and again and again. So this is actually really good use for recursion, if you're familiar with that concept, which is kind of 
using the same code over and over again because what we do at this top level where we divide it into four is exactly the same logic as what we do at this lower level so we kind of reuse the code in a way which means we just write one thing and it kind of keeps calling itself over and over and over until it's done so how the heck do we actually implement this so i'm gonna make a um separate class for this i should probably have just called it octree um So even though when I showed you this, the way we did it was we kind of had all of these objects here already, and then we started dividing up uh, the space. A more normal way, in fact, to do this is to kind of start with like an empty space and then go through and add all of our objects into it one by one. And every time we add it, if it causes... Um, the number of objects in one of the segments to grow beyond our threshold so beyond three then we would kind of split it and then we'd add the ne next object in and that may cause the tree to divide again and again so it's kind of flipped from how we did it so rather than looking at all of the objects and trying to build the tree kind of outright we start with an empty tree and then we just make the logic for adding a new object which may or may not cause it to kind of this subdivision to happen um yeah that just tends to be a more intuitive way to do this for whatever reason. The code just kind of works out neater that way. So that's what we're going to do. It means what we ultimately want to implement is a a function to add an object. Um, ultimately later we're going to want functions to give us all objects within a certain region for example. or give us all objects like close to another object, something like that. So what do we want? Um, so the interesting thing about a quad tree as well is that you can think of this cell as containing four other cells, and then this cell contains four other cells, and then this cell contains four other cells. And at each level, it's kind of the same structure. So it means that not only will our kind of functions for dealing with these things kind of work recursively but the structure itself is kind of recursive right so we can kind of think of this like a quad tree containing I'm going to call it a node or a tree node or maybe even a Maybe even a quad tree node. And a node can contain objects, potentially. Uh, so right now this node, you know, this kind of square here contains objects. But this node, represent, you know, this whole area doesn't really contain objects directly, it contains other nodes. So basically if it's a node which isn't subdivided, then it's going to contain its, its little list of objects directly. But when it subdivides, it's going to switch over to, instead of storing a list of objects, storing um, four other nodes, kind of in this case like this, directly and then sort of indirectly storing the objects because of its kind of child nodes. So we can look at something like, a simple way to do this is defining some variables for the things it contains. So what does our quadri here contain? It basically just contains a, a 
like a brute node, right? So in our tree, this this whole deal here would be the root node. This would be the you know top left child of that root node. This is the top right child of that root node, and so on, kind of recursively in this sort of nested Russian doll type structure. So conceptually, this can be kind of tricky to get your head around, but it actually ends up being implemented with like really pretty minimal code and is actually kind of super elegant in a way. So what do we do when we add something to a quad tree? Um, we in fact, just add it to our root node. So let's also give uh, this another function here. You know, there's an argument that I could ditch this class entirely and just have this root node be the thing that the main game code kind of accesses directly, but I'm going to kind of wrap this stuff up just for sort of organizational purposes. But yeah, know that it's not strictly necessary. Why is the indentation weird? Um, there we go. Oh, it's two spaces. Okay. I kept thinking it was three spaces, which is kind of odd. It's normally two or four, um, by convention. So, yeah, so when we add something in here, we need some kind of parameters here, right? So, Uh, let's actually define this right in the main sketch here. Kind of hacky, but it's fine for us. So we'll say max x per node. And in our example, use three. So we're going to use that same thing here. So yeah, when we add something, Basically, we need to see if adding this is going to like overflow our limit for how many objects we should be allowed to contain, if that makes sense. What I'm doing here, by the way, is pre-creating this list of objects contained within each node, and I'm sort of pre-sizing this list to have enough capacity to hold three objects in this case. Um, so there's two cases, right? So if it's size, if the size is already bigger or equal to the max number of projects per node, then we can't just put it in the objects, right? We're going to kind of need to subdivide and put it into one of our little children. Actually, let me flip this statement around. It's going to be a bit more natural to say if the size of objects is less than that, then we're just going to add it to objects. Add object, okay. Otherwise, again, there's two cases here, right? So if this is the first time we've sort of gone over that limit, then we're going to need to subdivide right now and actually like initialize all of our little child structures here. Um, but if we've already done that, like maybe this is the fifth thing we're trying to add in here, then we've already done the split and we just need to figure out which of our little children to pass the thing on to. So we're going to say if How do we know that it's time to split right now? We can say if the number of objects we contain is exactly equal to the maximum, it means we've just crossed the threshold now, so we actually need to uh, subdivide ourselves into our kind of four children. So I'm going to assume that we're going to have a little function to do that, which I will kind of figure out later. So we subdivide. And then we need to kind of um, 
put this out to another function. We need to... Whoa, hey Malieve, how's it going? <laughs> what have you been streaming? I saw you on FTL, right? How did that go? Hey, what we're making, by the way, is a... Oh, this looks way too mathy. <laughs> what we're making is a quad tree, an oct tree, which is a kind of computer graphics-y thing where you divide space up in this kind of weird fractal thing for the purposes of uh, physics and collision detection and all that kind of stuff. Um, Kester run. Okay, okay. Have you paused that, or are you are you are you um still kind of working on that in the background now? Yeah, you can do it. Come on, <laughs> we're cheering for you over here. Um. Anyway, yeah. So if we're adding something into this um cool little structure we have. Uh, yeah, so for anyone new, by the way, the basic pro concept of this thing is we want to divide up space based on the placement of objects in that space such that we keep dividing and dividing until we have only a couple of objects in each little cell here. And the purpose of this is that it allows us to efficiently do things like say, hey, give me all the objects nearby to this little guy. And the way we do that is we just look at whatever else is in its little cell. Um... And as we're like adding objects into this world, you know, if you try to add another object here, for example, or maybe into this cell, if we say the maximum number we could have in any cell is three, and then we try to add another fourth one here, then that should trigger like another little division to, to prevent this, the number of things in this cell from getting too large. A smelly garbage ship, okay. <laughs> What's wrong with Kestrel? Um, yeah, so if we, we've just crossed the threshold here. Ourselves, ourself, up. Okay, so it's like jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Okay, makes sense. Hopefully these comments will make this a little bit more clear. Yeah, so the logic is something like, when we try and add something, if we've still got space for it, then we just add it straight into this little list we're ma maintaining of what's like in this cell. Otherwise, if we've, if it's, if this is the first new object which is kind of crossed the threshold and we've sort of just filled up our capacity then we need to subdivide and then we need to figure out which of our children like top left top right bottom left bottom right the child should go into um which brings on something else which is that we kind of need to know the, the bounding area like the top bottom left or right of each of these little segments right so if we're looking at the cell that represents the whole world then we kind of have uh, like this top here, the bottom left and right, which we kind of want to keep track of. And then if we're putting something into one of its four immediate children, then we need to know, you know, the bounds of these things as well. So we're kind of going to need to track the top, bottom, left and right edges of all of these things. Had fortune in finding tools during the one that was fine it. Powerful in that basicness, okay. 
no worries. Nice of you to drop him a leave. Good luck with the run, whenever you do that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you need to kind of know the game and all the different systems and items to be able to adapt. If it doesn't have a particular theme, you can lean into maybe. Um, okay, so let's keep track of these bounds, right? So. Uh, and then maybe when we construct one of these nodes, we can pass those things in. So when we create a new node, I'm going to store those things away. this so hopefully the correct capitalization um so there's one little subtlety we need to care about which is in this case for example if you're trying to figure out if an object should go into like this node or this node if it lies exactly on the line we need some kind of tie break so a common way to do that is to say, um, maybe for the left, anything that's equal to or greater than is considered fitting. But on the right hand side, anything that's exactly equal to this will be actually be considered like part of the, the rightmost. It's kind of arbitrary. We could do that the other way around, but we need just some consistent rule to cover that. So I think what I'm going to make is another little handy function. to check whether any particular point is within the bounds of this kind of node. It's within the bounds. And how we do that, can I just encode that same logic I just talked about, which is, so if the, if the points X is greater than or equal to our left bound, and it's, is less than our right bound, so stuff which lies directly on our left-hand border we're going to include, but stuff on the right-hand border we're not, because that's going to actually get attributed to like our, our neighbor on the right, if you like. And very similar for Y. Let's just say if it's... Hang on, is a top a high number or a low number? It's actually a low number in processing. Okay. So what I was kind of figuring out there is X coordinates run like left to right, right? So this is like zero and this is like 400 or minus 400 and 400, whatever it is. But Y coordinates by default in processing start kind of from the top left. So this would be like zero and then increasing this way. Or this would be like minus 400 and this would be plus 400. So stuff on the top actually has lower Y coordinates, if that makes sense. It's confusing, like top and lower getting like mixed like that, but that's kind of the way it works. So okay, so this is a little useful function to tell us whether a point is within our bounds. And in fact, we could do something here like if... Somebody could try and put an object in here, which is like outside of our bounds, which shouldn't really ever happen. So let's shout at the user for doing that, because that's that's kind of that's bad, and let's just bail out in that case. Um, so now we need to think about subdividing and adding to children. So let's cover subdividing first. 
So let's say if we have this cell and we want to subdivide it, the key things we need to figure out are we already know our like top, top, bottom, left, and right positions. But when we subdivide, we're kind of going to need to figure out the halfway points, right? Like the the point here, which is going to define our our new like boundary here, and then similarly here, we kind of need this halfway point between top and bottom. So let's first calculate those things. Ooh, caps lock. Um. Uh, in fact, this is the way we do that. You can think of this as like taking the average of the left and right, which kind of naturally gives you the middle. A more roundabout way, but maybe a more intuitive way would be figure out the difference between left and right, and then like divide that by two and then add it onto the left, if that makes sense. But the math all works out that this is actually kind of the succinct way to express that same thing. So you know, and it kind of makes sense that if the you know if this is minus four hundred x and this is four hundred and we're trying to find the midpoint, then it's gonna be the average of those two, which is zero right in the middle. So we've got those midpoints. Now we need to create and sort of populate our little children here, right? So create this new node so what is the top so the top of our top left is actually just our top same thing but the bottom of it is not our bottom it's actually the midpoint on the y-axis and then was it left so that's actually our okay that's top left, and we can do something. This is where you always like get something slightly wrong and get one of these variables wrong, but we can do this. So top right, again, in terms of top and bottom, it's the same, but the left point is actually the, the midpoint, and the right point is actually our right bound. So our top left starts at our top, and ends like halfway down and it starts right at the left and ends like in the middle whereas our top right kind of starts in the middle and ends like right on our right hand side so hopefully that makes sense you can kind of visualize what's going on there um i'm actually going to copy these cannot spell bottom apparently you'll find there's certain words i just cannot type cannot type correctly I find I can't type the word apocalypse, it always comes out as something crazy, apocalypse or something. Okay, so the bottom ones, they're, they're going to differ in their sort of top and bottom, in that they're not going to start at the top, they're going to start at the midpoint, and they're going to go down to the bottom. Same thing here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there's actually one other subtle thing which needs to happen is that when we subdivide, we already contain some stuff. So we're going to need to immediately like pass all that out to our children based on the positions of those things. So I'm actually going to say, I almost forgot this. This is something you could super easily forget. Um, I'm going to add to appropriate child object. And then probably what I should do is maybe clear out this object list. We don't need them anymore. There are versions of these structures where, you know, this like root node could still contain this list of everything. And then this node in the bottom right could still contain the list of everything in it, even if they're also doing the subdivision thing. And in some cases that might be actually useful, depending on exactly how you want to use this thing. But I'm going to... When we subdivide, I'm going to say we're going to clear out our own list and just push that stuff all all down to our 
subdivided little children nodes and let them deal with it. We don't care about those objects anymore. Okay, so here's where we actually add this thing to a child. Um, uh, and there's actually a pretty, maybe not the most efficient, but a pretty nice way we can do this. Which we can just kind of say if if it's within the bounds of the top left, then we're going to add it to the top left. Otherwise, if it's within the bounds of something else, and so on and so on. It's probably marginally inefficient since we're doing this calculation many times. We could probably um, like recalculate these midpoints and do it a little bit more directly. But since we've already got this nice function, I'm not. I'm just going to reuse that functionality, just knowing in my mind that we could probably optimize this slightly if we if we really wanted to. Totem. Yeah, apparently I really can't spell that. Um, I think what I also want to do is uh, probably just print out a bit of debugging stuff here. So we know when this happens. Probably never happen either. But in any case, if it does, I want to know because it probably means there's another bug in our code. Okay, we wrote a lot of code before running the program. Like this, you can't really make this work without sort of writing all of this stuff. So let's maybe step through a simple test case and see what happens here. So right off the bat, I'm probably going to remove or reduce the number of these objects something more reasonable. You also need to initialize this, right? So and we probably want to give it its bounds, kind of very similar like this. Yeah. You can kind of see this is actually sort of totally redundant, and I could just create a quadri node here. The fact we've wrapped it in this class is kind of useless. Maybe there's some convenience utility function that we could put down here. But, you know, I've done it now, so, so be it. In fact, I'm going to do a bit more printing here. So we can kind of make sure conceptually this is appears to be doing what it's seems to be or should be doing. now we should be able to create our little tree here and 
and then let's initialize it down here. In fact, so I talked about the fact that... Okay, you know what, I'll save that for later. What I was going to say is that typically you actually create a new quad tree every frame. If these objects are moving around, rather than trying to figure out what happens, you know, if this object moves like to here, you could figure out, oh, maybe I take it out of this node and then maybe this whole thing needs to like, can like unsubdivide now, then I need to move it in here and maybe that sub is subdivided. It's generally easier just to start with a fresh blank quad tree every frame, add every object into it, have it parcel things out and subdivide. Yeah, and then just use it. It's both more convenient and less error prone to do that. And generally speaking, performance wise, it tends to be just fine to do that as well. In most cases. I've also been inconsistent about whether I capitalize the T of Quadri, which is kind of bothers me. So oh, let's fix it. It also took me ages to realize that I had to click this to rename a file. Like, I've got this selected, it's still this that I need to click. I thought I couldn't do it, I'm trying to right click and stuff and nothing was happening. Oh, okay, it doesn't like changing the case if I don't change the actual name. Kind of a quirk of Windows file name, case sensitivity I think. There we go, there we go. Also now it sorts in a more sensible order. I'm more happy about that than I probably should be. So let's create a quad tree. We know that it goes from... Uh, which order were these? Top, bottom, left, right. Get the same things here. Okay, and then let's do something like... Okay, so I'm going to run this, it's going to print out a load of crap down at the bottom most likely. Um, and we can kind of try and figure out from that whether it's working properly. What I may do though is add a bit of visual visualization stuff so we can more visually kind of inspect and validate what's happening. So something happened and it did not crash. Let's see if we can read this little log and see if this makes sense to us. So we're creating a node. In fact, let's can we can we draw this out at the same time? We should maybe we should. Let me clear everything off here. So we created a node going from minus 400 to 400 on X and the same on Y. So it seems like that's just creating our baseline daily like this. Just like that. Cool. And then at a certain point we subdivided. We created one from minus 400 0 to minus 400 0, which it seems would cover this area minus 400, zero, minus 400, zero. And our other nodes, zero, 400, minus 400, zero. Yeah, this seems to cover the spaces we would hope. Um, this is weird though. Is this the same subdivision happening twice? Okay, that does not make sense to me. So something is going slightly wrong here would you know once this subdivision has happened it should not just subdivide like this again it should um like i've just figured out why this happened um <laughs> okay the reason this happened is because in this logic here we're using the size of this object list to determine whether we need to subdivide right now and stuff like that but actually when we subdivide, we clear out the list. So it forgets how many things are in there. So I think I will not do that.
Or another way to do this is to check if it's if something is subdivided. So um, is it subdivided? It's subdivided if we could add a flag like a boolean for this, but if these are initialized, then it means we've subdivided already, right? So I can just say pick one of those at random and say if. Was it left top? What did I call it? If. Right, so if our top left child is not null, meaning it's been set up, then it means we must have subdivided, kind of by definition. So now maybe I change this logic to something a bit different. So if is subdivided, then I'm just going to add it straight into a child. Otherwise, something like this, right? So we've still got capacity, then we add it. Otherwise, we need to do the subdivision here. OK. Can we simplify this? Shortcut, I wanted auto format. Short T. Okay, so here's the logic. When a new object comes in, if we've already subdivided, we're just going to shove it into one of our child nodes. Otherwise, if we've still got enough space, we're going to add it into our list. Otherwise, the only other possibility is that we're now full up and we haven't yet subdivided. So we subdivide it right now and then we add it into our children thing. And now I can clear this again. Hopefully this works. Let me see some more reasonable output here. Okay, it's subdivided only once. Kind of makes sense. We only had 10 objects in there up to three per cell. If we upped this to like 30, I'd expect to see probably more subdivisions happening. Boom. And it did, and we can see that the first set, the first node kind of goes from minus 400 to 400, covering the whole world, then it gets cut in half, and then in half again. And then another section, yeah, so these, these are getting smaller and smaller, so it appears to be doing what we would hope. So let's do something where we can actually start drawing these things so we can start visualizing this happening. So um, I'm just going to do public void draw. And how do we draw these things? We do something like, well, if, the, if we're subdivided, then I'm just going to draw my children. Otherwise, I'm going to draw my own sort of bounds. And how do we do that? We probably want to draw a rectangle, which starts from our top left. Nope. Uh, so this is top left x, y. This is kind of the parameters rect expect. And then it probably wants a width and height. So our width is like that, and our height is so that's what we kind of should kind of look like. Uh, and let's look in as well to how this is kind of styled. So let's do like 
screen. No fill. Is it stroke width or stroke weight? Looks like stroke weight. Let's make it three pixels. Okay, so how do we? How does one of these things draw itself? If it's subdivided, it just gets its children to draw it itself. Otherwise, it draws a box. So in this case, you know, when our world is like this and it's not subdivided, oh. ah. we're just going to draw the box. If it is subdivided, then we're going to draw like four boxes, like one for each kind of child, like this. Uh, there are different ways we could have done this. You know, we could have drawn the box and then calculated the midpoints and just drawn that like plus shape, but. This is in the spirit of this very recursive nested structure to just get our child children nodes to draw themselves like that. So this quadri class is becoming more and more useless, but because all it's doing is like wrapping up a single object and then calling the exact same methods on that object, so pretty redundant. But what are we gonna do? We draw the objects. Now let us draw the core tree. I'm hoping this will work properly with the whole PC cam. The thing I'm not sure how drawing rects works in 3D. Oh, looks pretty good to me. So something interesting happened where all of those spheres disappeared. Maybe because they have no fill color. Yeah, it appears that was it. So, okay, the issue there was that the first time through, these things all got drawn nicely, but then when we asked the quad tree to draw, it turned off the fill. And then the next time the next frame was drawing, the fill was still turned off, so the, the spheres essentially were like transparent. They had no color to them. So we need to put that uh, that white kind of fill back on. Yeah, something to be very cautious of is that any stuff you do, like turning the stroke off, turning lighting on, changing colors will like carry over to any subsequent stuff, including like subsequent runs through of the draw function. So if you do stuff like flicker and change and get weirdly colored or disappear, then it's probably something to do with that. Okay, so this is all well and good, and it looks pretty correct to me, right? Like, we've implemented a quad tree here, and it seems like each cell only ever has up to three objects in it, so that appears to be working just fine. Um, something kind of quite cool we could do is have it so that rather than adding all these objects at once, we can add them one by one and watch the quad tree kind of change over time. So. Let's do something where a key is pressed. Let's say if if it's the space key. By the way, this is a really weird way of detecting the space key. I don't like that processing does it this way, but what are you going to do? I'm going to... Um, I'm going to take this code, actually, and move it out here. So we're going to generate a random point. We're going to add it to our object list, and we're going to add it to the quad tree all in one go. So we're actually going to start with a totally empty quadri and no objects. But now, hopefully, as I tap the spacebar, uh, it will kind of add them bit by bit, and we can see in a more intuitive way, kind of step by step, how this whole quadri thing works. OK, start off with an empty box. I'm going to press space. A node has appeared. There are still less than three things here, so it's quite happy to just sit like that. Add another. Add another. We're all good. So it feels like adding the next one should cause a subdivision. There we go. It did exactly what we hoped, I think. Let's add some more. Keep doing this. Okay, fourth one dropped in here, and it caused this to split again. So hopefully this is kind of a more intuitive way pure to see like how this is expected to work and how this kind of process works. So it's actually kind of 
in a way pretty simple and elegant I think and we'll maybe play around after this with why this is actually powerful and useful yeah so also we'll probably extend this to 3d because it's actually almost exactly the same logic it's just you now need to think about having eight children instead of four but it's literally the same the same logic to be honest okay so we add things when one of these cells gets too big when it's hammering space by now it will subdivide and everything is nice everything is lovely now let's think about um uh doing something kind of useful for this. The whole point of this structure is that it's, I called it a spatial index, right? And the idea is that it supports certain queries we could make of it. We should be able to say things like, let me draw a box here and give me everything within that box. And that's what this is supposed to allow us to do like very efficiently. So we should probably think about implementing some kind of uh, logic kind of akin to that. So, yeah, if we're trying to find out, so this is subdivided a bit more. If we're trying to pass this in like a, a region, which we're interested in. You know, you imagine if this is an MMO and these are all of the little players moving around. Maybe we want to find out all the players within like... Uh, whisper range right or like within audible range or something like that for the chat function then we could maybe draw a box around that particular character and say give me everyone within that box and then your chat message is going to be sent to them because they're like within range so rather than having to check every player on the server we can use this tree which we've already created um and then whenever somebody sends a chat message then we can quickly ask the quad tree to say give me everyone who is within this area or at the very least we can say give me any object within a cell which kind of overlaps it so maybe it actually gives us like this whole area right because this this cell here kind of overlaps with it so does this one and so does this one but it at least like narrows down the filtering we have to do like potentially like really really substantially because it can kind of give us stuff which isn't quite overlapping here we call this broad phase collision detection normally meaning that this is just like a first pass to narrow down what we're looking for and then you know narrow phase would be actually checking the positions of all of these things to make sure they're you know in the box but you can do that as a second step and that narrowing down this like super efficient narrowing down makes the whole thing like way faster so it feels like in order to do that, we're going to need to know whether a certain cell um, overlaps with uh, any kind of arbitrary box or rectangle we give it. So I'm going to say, create a little function here, which returns whether it overlaps with a certain rectangle. And again, for the rectangle, I'm going to pass in some kind of bounds like this. Let's call it rick top. Okay, how the heck is this going to work? Let me simplify this diagram again. Okay, so if we're talking about this cell, for example, and we want to know if it overlaps with this rectangle, how can we check that? So maybe a better way to phrase the question is how do we know that something, you know, maybe this rectangle definitely doesn't overlap with it. Or we can say that if the left-hand side of this rectangle is to the right of our right-hand border, then it can't overlap with us, right? Because it's entirely off to our right. Similarly, if the right hand side of something is to the left of our leftmost part, then it can't overlap with us, and same for top and bottom. 
So essentially this is how we would implement something like this. So uh, uh, okay, I'll keep this more succinct ways, but I'm going to say if if the rect left is to the right of our of our right bound, or if the rectangle's right is less than or to the left of our left bound, or if the bottom of the rectangle is less than our hang on. The rectangle is left than less than our Um, yep. Or if the top of the rectangle is entirely rectangle equal to our So we've got this kind of set up and a, actually a simpler way to write this is to turn the sort of inverse of this is equivalent, right? Like if this is true, return false, otherwise return true. It's the same as return not. This kind of means not or kind of flipping true and false. Yeah, so hopefully that gives us what we need. Um, let's actually start here defining a rectangle that we care about. Um, I'm going to call it the, the query rect, and I'm going to give it various bounds, so left, right, top, and bottom, nope, spelled bottom correctly this time, the rare thing, okay. Um, and... <laughs> For now, I think I'm just going to set it up here with this sort of arbitrary area. So let's say it goes from minus 40. This is again totally arbitrary numbers I'm making up. So draw this thing, so uh, in fact this is in the draw function, which I did not realize. I thought I was in setup. So let us move this to setup. Again, this is a little sample for debugging testing purposes, so it's gonna start at Hopefully we've defined our rectangle, which we'll be able to see. Okay, we can add stuff to our tree. I don't like that that lies right on that line, so I'm just going to tweak. This, now what I want to do is maybe um, do something like if If it overlaps with our little 
quivery rectangle. If it overlaps that, then I'm going to colour it one colour. Otherwise, I'm going to colour it another colour. Missing a bracket. Add some stuff. We can hopefully see now that this is working. I'm going to add loads and loads of crap in here. Okay. So we can see with that simple little bounds check any sections which are overlapping this little rectangle are coloured in yellow and any which aren't are kind of coloured in green. Kind of have to ignore this little quirk here. It's because we kind of draw this rectangle in yellow and then we draw this one in green like later on so it kind of gets over the top. Uh, Actually, there's a neat kind of way to prevent that somewhat, which is maybe to say we're going to draw it in a thicker stroke if it does overlap, and a narrower stroke otherwise. Nope. Got this line of code still. That was kind of pointless, but it kind of did the job. Yeah, so you can see that any cell which overlaps with this is highlighted, so we have an easy way now to check that that's the case. Um, so another thing we can do is to somehow get, get all of the objects in the quad tree which are within a certain rectangle. So I'm going to make a little, little function where we want it to return us a list of any um, objects, any positions within a certain rectangle. And this is really getting to the meat of what these things are useful for in practice. So how do we do this? We probably need to put the same function in our actual node, and that's kind of where the logic actually needs to sit. So. Create a list to hold our results. And then what can we say? We can say if firstly we should probably check whether we overlap this thing at all. Then we need to do something. If if not, then you know, there's no work to be done, like the rectangle which we've been passed in, like doesn't even, it's totally irrelevant to us, so we can just do nothing. So if it overlaps with us, what do we want to do? So it depends if we're subdivided, right? So if, if we're subdivided, then we're going to do something involving our children. The else case is actually a bit easier to write here. And we're saying they're doing this kind of query and they're asking, you know, if we overlap with that rectangle, um, then the results are going to kind of contain our children, right? And if we subdivide it, then we kind of need to 
um, ask all of our children whether this thing kind of overlaps with them. So we can do something like uh, again this pattern of delegating stuff to the children. Okay, so then we've kind of got these results here. So what's the logic here? So somebody tells us a rectangle they're interested in all of the objects inside it. We create an empty list to start holding our results. If we overlap in any way with that rectangle, then we're either going to add all of our objects into it if we're not subdivided. But if we do have children, then we to ask them to add to do that same kind of query and add all of that object to this kind of list of results we're, we're building up. So, you know, if this rectangle doesn't overlap with top left, then top left is going to um, just return nothing. Otherwise, they're going to potentially delegate work to their own children or return the objects they contain kind of accordingly. Yeah, so I think that kind of gives us something there. So we can maybe do something now like this. So. Um, um, so getting a list of everything in the rectangle. Now we can do something like it's an array list. Something like this. So we can say maybe if then we're gonna colour it red. Otherwise we're gonna colour it white. So now hopefully what this will give us is any objects in a cell which overlaps our, overlaps our rectangle will be colored. I did not implement this, so... Um. Again, kind of pointless function in our little useless wrapping class. Yeah, I think we got the colors correct. Okay. So we can see what's happening here is any cell of our quadri which overlaps with this, any objects in that are considered to like potentially be overlapping with this rectangle. Of course, it's a bit over eager because even though this corner's overlapping, like this object's still relatively far away. But the more we subdivide, actually the more accurate this will become. And since the whole point of these things is to deal with many, many thousands of objects, it actually ends up being more or less accurate. So add more and more stuff. More, 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 more. Yeah, you can see the more we subdivide, the closer this approximation becomes to actually matching that rectangle. Um, and, you know, we've got this wrapping class. We could have it do something kind of useful, perhaps, in that we could do the... So right now this is like what we call the broad phase check, right? Because it includes things which aren't actually in the rectangle, but are just like in a cell which is touching it. So we could do a more fine-grained filter by actually checking positions of these specific objects, kind of maybe at this point here, right? So, so let's say create a list of candidates.
and then we can kind of do a filter, right? So. a new list and then we can go through each candidate and then we can then do the actual kind of fine grade check so we can say if candidate dot x is greater than or equal to right left and can be pasting actually. Again, I'm applying the same rule of um, greater than or equal to on the left and strictly less than on the right. some trouble typing that for some reason. Okay, so now when we see this, this should now have become a more exact thing. I feel like we're missing a bracket somewhere. Ah. to water from it like that. I'm okay with that. Okay, hopefully we see this working if something actually lands in there. Okay, this is wrong. <laughs> what have we done wrong? Probably that final filtering, right? So these objects clearly are within there. So... Ah, this should be Y. Easy copy paste mistake there. Okay, that's not in. That's in. Awesome. This appears to be doing the job. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Sweet. So we are seeing our quad tree behaving as expected. It's giving us some efficient functionality for kind of looking up stuff which is in a rectangle. But you might be thinking, you know, this is a lot of work just to check what's in a rectangle. Could we really not just loop through every object and do this same little check here? Uh, the answer is yes, and this really only becomes useful when you're doing many, many different checks per frame. So, you know, right now I'm checking this one rectangle. What if we change this to... What if we want to find any objects which is like close to another object? Like, like these two, right, are fairly close to each other. We could instead make many queries saying, hey, give me anything within a certain rectangle of this, uh, you know, a certain rectangle of this, and we could use it to find these pairs or clusters of things. And instead of doing one query per frame, we'd be doing like hundreds or thousands of them. And that's when this really comes into its own, I think. So let's kind of do something like that. So. What would that look like? It would be something like, rather than this, I'm going to do a... Find any objects which are close to others, does that make sense? Um, and I'm going to change this to something like...
or objects close to others. It's kind of a weird way of phrasing it. Okay, and then what I want to do is go through every every object and I'm going to do a query for every object for the little immediate vicinity of that object. So we could do something like objects close to me. We probably want a range for this, right? So scroll over, please. There we go. Closeness range, we'll call it, of I don't know, like fifteen. Yeah, we can we can play around and change that. So, how do we find things which may be close to me? Uh, so we need to again fill in this top, bottom, left, and right, and we can now see something like um, dot. So the top. It's a low number subject, my minus. Okay, so what we're kind of doing is defining a box around one of these. So we take its position. We're going to, our sort of search range is this closeness range variable. So we're going to subtract on the x to get the left. We're going to add on x to create the right. We're going to subtract on the y axis to create the top and add on the bottom, and that will then define a kind of box like this, which is how we're going to try and find things which are close to each other. So... This is where I'm kind of anal about how we indent these. Very similar for X. Oh, it indented it nicely somehow. Okay, so this is the list of objects close to me, and I can now say, um, okay, so I could just trust this. If I want to be really strict, like if something's, this will include something right on the corner of this box, right? Where if we're really being true to this closeness range, it should actually be like uh, a circle. Oh, this is turning green because I've got a weird blend mode on. That's probably why stuff wasn't drawing correctly before. Yeah, so we actually want to kind of check in a circle if we really want to check distance, so we can add, if you like, an even narrower phase to this um, uh, check, right? Which is something like we're going to have to loop over all of these things. Ah, why is the indent so screwed up? So for every object close to me in the objects close to me thing, we're going to do a, like, a more fine-grained distance check. So one way to do that is just to straight up calculate the distance. So the distance is equal to object dot. Since these are vector objects, it actually has a distance function built in where you can compare two things to get a distance. And I'm going to say if um, the distance is within our closeness range, then I don't know, I'm going to call this objects with neighbors. If we're within range, then we're close to something else. Then we're going to add ourselves in here. Hey, piggy bank. Thanks so much for the raid. What have you been streaming just before this? Hey, no, really, really appreciate it. Um, so what we're working on today, by the way, is making a quad tree and then maybe potentially an ox tree. If you're familiar with what that is, it is a oh, wrong tab. 
It is a system for dividing up space based on the objects which are kind of within that space. And this is used for in games for things like collision detection and graphics. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah I'm sure you're probably aware of this if you're doing some minimap optimization. What's the puzzle game like? Do you want to drop your uh, any links you have, like any social links and stuff you want to share with our admittedly small <laughs> viewership? You're more than welcome to do that. We do really appreciate the raid and the support. Yeah, I'll be sure to check out your stuff after this. Um, yeah, so we're working on, <laughs> we're working on this um, structure, and also thanks for the follow. Princess Castle Quest, awesome. I have to let Paul, one of my fellow Stray Basilisk devs, know because he's super into puzzle games. I don't know if he's on the stream now, but um, I know he'd be super into that. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly comment some stuff out so we can check what the heck's going on in our code already and maybe explain to you all what's happening. This is, it looks, really does look like the Arduino ID, doesn't it? So this is processing. Processing is a Java based framework for sort of creative programming and graphics stuff. It's like a single program, self-contained, you can download it, uses Java syntax, but it's kind of geared towards beginners and people who want to make like interactive visualizations and graphical stuff. And it's just the quickest way I'm aware of, of like just getting graphics on screen. Basically you load it up and you can say, draw a rectangle at these coordinates, like with one line and it's it's there's no real overhead to it. So I like it for these self-contained streams. Like what we normally do here is every week for every stream, we'll do a different self-contained project from scratch. So it really works for that format. And what we've been building is this uh, quad tree thing. And the way a quad tree works is it's a way of dividing up space so that you can efficiently find objects in that space. So for example, we've got this kind of world defined by this yellow rectangle. Every time I press space, it adds a little object in here. And the way a quad tree works is when um, you get enough of these objects within your quad tree, then it like subdivides itself, right? So it's trying to make sure there are never more than three objects in any one cell. And as I add more, you'll see that it, if you add too many, it will like subdivide and subdivide. And it does this recursively, so I can add loads of things and it will subdivide endlessly based on the number of objects I'm adding here. I'm just hammering the space bar. And then what you can do is you can use this to efficiently ask questions like give me all objects within a certain area so we've defined this little rectangle and what it's doing is it's um yeah there are different forms of this right you have octrees and like bsp and other ways of dividing it but it's if you're used to recursion then it's actually kind of intuitive and with a fairly minimal amount of code you can make something quite powerful but what it allows you to do is say give, efficiently give me all of the cells which like touch this rectangle and then that lets me filter out any objects like within the rectangle. Um, and where this really shines is when you're trying to do loads of these like queries or checks every frame. So what I'm just working on now is changing this code. So rather than just doing this, checking for this one rectangle, every little object here is going to check a little rectangle around itself so that we can try and identify like nearby objects. And you could easily see how this would be useful in a game context for like collision or like we talked about an example in an MMO where you have like a, a range for your chat, like where nearby players will hear your chat messages and far away players won't. So this structure allows you, once you've built it and sort of kept this structure maintained, it allows you to very efficiently do those things. Yeah. So if I jump back over to the code, we've got something here whereby we can do something like um, yeah, so CGM, so this is processing, which basically is a library for Java. It also comes with this self-contained little IDE thing. So you can use it as a library within Java, or you can just kind of write it in this IDE. But it, yeah, it's all kind of compatible and ultimately built uh, on Java. For better or for worse, right? Like it's not the, the ideal game dev language, but it's like a very, very lightweight little framework, which I like to use. Um, JVM for the win. Yeah, for whatever reason in my previous corporate career before the whole game dev thing, I worked a lot with Java and got familiar and comfortable with it. So JVM's cool. I'd like to play around with Kotlin or something at some point. 
The most recent thing I picked up was Go, or, or Golang, so that's kind of what I've been noodling around with in my spare time. But yeah, I guess I guess Java is a go-to go to thing for me. So yeah, so what this structure allows us to do is it allows us to pass in like a bounding rectangle, and it will just return any objects which overlap with that. So this is what we were doing for highlighting this little red set of objects here within this rectangle. And what we're doing now is we're changing this to, I want to identify any object which is within X number of, you know, X number of coordinates from any other object. So, you know, these two would probably qualify since they're near to each other, whereas maybe this one wouldn't because it's not near to anything in particular. So I'm trying to build up a list of any object with nearby neighbors. And the way we do that is we just go through every object. We ask the quad tree, hey, give me anything within a little bounding rectangle of myself. Java is taking up resistance as your least favorite language. I think that's fair. I can definitely understand why people feel that way. Like it's a crazy, it's very corporate and there's this whole big ecosystem around it and an insane number of libraries and open source projects. So there's a lot of good stuff out there to use, but often it's not super well documented or it's really obscure or there are a million different ways to do things. So I probably would not start again with Java if I had the luxury of the choice. Doesn't have unsigned numbers. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting point. So I learned something. My, my personal least favorite is probably like PHP or Perl. Um, I heard something about PHP the other day which horrified me, which is that if you have an integer in PHP, and you keep incrementing it until it gets, it basically overflows like a 32-bit integer, it silently turns into a floating point number. Yeah. Perl is just super ugly and very 80s, I feel like, but I don't know. Some people are productive with it, but it's really unreadable to me. Yeah, but this thing that in PHP where if, if an integer gets big enough, it just turns into a float is is nuts. That's just crazy. How, how the hell do you code around that and... <laughs> deal with those bugs I mean it gets the job done right I had to do some like WordPress stuff and little PHP stuff in various contexts and it's it's fine but I yeah I don't I don't love it <laughs> yeah so anyway what we're doing is we're querying stuff in a little bounding box around our nodes like this and then anything that that returns from the quad tree um, we're then doing an actual like a regular old distance check doing the whole expensive square root operation that requires, but hopefully things have been really filtered down before we need to do that. So, yeah, so I look at all objects close to me according to the quad tree, I loop over them, I calculate the actual distance, and then this is our final, final check if they're within range. Then I'm going to add myself to this list and I'm going to break out of here. I don't need to do any more checks. So, hopefully now, I can color anything which has a neighbor in red. I probably don't need to draw a little query rect anymore because that's not really doing anything. Get rid of some other <laughs> horrible debugging code. And then run this and see what happens. I probably missed a bracket somewhere. There we go. Ooh, everything's turning red. That's probably because objects are being compared to themselves and they're close to themselves. So I forgot the really standard thing of if if I'm comparing myself to myself. Considering yourself a neighbor, it seems very slightly over optimistic. <laughs> Maybe that's a good worldview, but in this context doesn't make sense. Yeah, PHP a lot of libraries. I, I hear that like modern PHP these days is pretty good. I just still have scars from the old, like maybe late 90s, like early 2000s versions. Okay, let me add enough things that we get some neighbors and I can see if this thing is working. Okay. Don't know if you notice here, but these two are pretty close to each other and they got tagged as having a neighbor. That is two things, by the way, and not one.
Awesome. So this thing is now running like many, many queries each frame, and we can maybe do a little really rough uh, performance check to see how long this takes, and then compare that to the manual way of actually comparing every object against every other one, which we kind of had needed to do otherwise. So I think what I'll do is... Uh, you know what? Okay, let's do this. So there is a millis function which gives us the time in milliseconds. What I'm going to do is... out here so I can print out how long that took no time at all add more stuff add more stuff this is fast right we've, we've got hundreds of objects now and it's still coming out as a barely measurable amount of time. I could probably use a more accurate timer, but this is probably fine just now. So now let's see how long this would take to do without the benefit of our lovely quadri. So I'm going to kind of copy and paste this down here. Neighbors. Uh, the, the manual approach, we'll call it. Or... Naive is the more fancy term, I guess. If I could spell it, probably too fancy a term. Um, yeah, so rather than being able to query objects close to me, I just need to go up around every other object. Hey Celis, thanks so much for the follow. Uh, let's also print out the number of objects, that seems sensible. And C underscore underscore JM. You too. What do we call you? JM? CJM? <laughs> what kind of stuff have you been doing with PHP then? Is this like web development stuff? Let's add. You know what? Let's change this to add like 10 objects at a time because this is way too slow. By the way, if you don't like Java, one of the little channel rewards we have on this stream is to force me to do an online coding challenge in the language of your choice. So if you're feeling sadistic, that is <laughs> that option is available to you. Oh, awesome, awesome. Web dev stuff. Yeah, you end up having to do a lot of PHP. It can't really be avoided, I think. So we add more stuff, add more stuff. Okay, so when we had like 1700 objects, it's taking two or three times longer to do this with our sort of manual approach, comparing every object with every other, hence using the quad tree. And there are actually some very, very obvious optimizations, which I might quickly make before we wrap up the stream, which will, I believe, bring this down potentially quite a lot. It was modern, so it's nice. Yeah, c -shot. I hear like the... Uh, .NET stuff for web dev is pretty nice to use as well. Types are nice, yeah. I'm a I'm a strongly typed kind of guy. <laughs> okay, so there is one 
issue, which I think may be contributing to Quadru being a little bit slow, which is this. So the way that we're doing this query is we have this recursive thing going on where if we want to find out um, all the objects in a certain rectangle, um, we first check if any given node of the quad tree overlaps with it, and if it does, we recursively kind of call into our children, our full children, to have them tell us any objects which they contain. But each time we do that, we're actually allocating this big new list of results, right? So what happens is I allocate this list, I call into my four children, they also allocate a list, and then return it back up, and then um, uh, I add everything to it. So there are many, many lists being constructed and then like combined and merged together. And a slightly nicer way to do this is to just have uh, a list which kind of just, just gets passed around recursively and everything everything at every level of the tree just adds stuff into this one list. So it prevents us having to allocate all these extra lists which can actually really drag drag things down. So rather than returning a list, we're going to have it, we're going to pass in a list to it and have it just add its results into it. So this is a very common pattern for a very simple optimization to, um, I guess, re remove unnecessary like allocation of stuff and creating thousands of lists and merging them together and then throwing them away. Every frame in Java is not ideal. So we can kind of circumvent that using this little approach here. Um, so we no longer need to return it. And then all we do is when the query sort of starts off, we we just define this sort of out here. And we actually already have a upper bound on the number of things this could return, which is the total number of objects. So we could like pre-size pre this to prevent reallocations and make it even better, but I don't think we actually need to do that. Okay. Or we could even have used a linked list or something like that. Okay, so this is slightly more efficient now, the only difference being we construct one list and then as we evaluate the query and look for stuff in a region, we just add it into that list rather than having them return lists and like merging all those lists together, which is convenient but kind of ugly. So let's add a bunch more stuff again. I think we had about 1800 objects last time and we'll see now if the quadri is faster than before. This is not the most objective speed measurement. I'm not using a very high resolution sort of function to check this. But already, if you're looking in the bottom left at those timings, I feel like this is way faster, right? What did we have before? Like five, six milliseconds with the quad tree? Now it's down to just two. So we can see that, yeah, any slowdown before was mostly a slightly inefficient implementation, but fundamentally this structure is Right now it's like five times faster and that's only going to get better because this naive method of checking everything against everything else is exponentially increases, right? It's like an n squared deal. Whereas the quad tree, you basically have like a more of like a logarithmic thing because you're like subdividing the problem. So I could slam in loads more objects and honestly, it's going to be the rendering which slows this down rather than the actual calculations. Yeah. So my initial plan was to take this 3D and turn this into a quad tree, sorry, an octree rather than a quad tree, but I think time is running short, so I probably won't go on to do that. But the principle is exactly the same. So rather than dividing into four, we instead divide a cube into eight, like a two by two Rubik's cube kind of arrangement. And really the only way the code needs to change is uh, we have a couple of functions like to do some simple like rectangle bounds checking and stuff like that. Yeah, so 
in processing, no, actually. Like that's this IDE is more of a little small self-contained project or like beginner friendly thing. So it's it's debugger and profiling stuff is really not very fully featured. Although having said that, Java has pretty amazing the JVM has pretty amazing like profiling tools, like super, super in-depth. You can profile pretty much anything in crazy granularity. So yeah, that could be done. So we okay, so we removed a significant chunk of time just by optimizing the like allocations a bit. Um Yeah, but I think right now this is relatively as efficient as this would be in terms of like big O type stuff at least. Um Yeah, and it seems to do the job relatively well. It's already many times faster than doing this in the naive method, and if we had you know more and more objects, you could see this this divergence would get like even bigger. Um yeah, honestly I'm just using a really crappy built-in timer which only has millisecond resolution, so trying to profile more with that would probably be a non-starter, but yeah, so we have something there. Um okay one last thing which might be kind of cool is right now we're building the quad tree once and then we're adding stuff to it incrementally but a more common situation is where these objects are all like moving around and we would generally throw away and rebuild the quad tree every frame um so let's do it like that right so let's get rid of these variables we no longer need for that debugging stuff and instead of creating a quad tree once in setup, I'm going to, while timing this quad tree, I'm gonna construct a new one and then just add everything to it. So, as simple as that. Uh, then I'm going to do the same thing, and then what I think I will do is like make these points move around slightly, so. My code's getting a little bit messy here. Um, These are mutable, right? Are these mutable? Yeah, they must be. Okay. So let's just randomly like perturb these things if you like. So they will sort of jitter and wander around. And now we're essentially allocating a totally new quad tree, adding everything into it, and then doing all of our queries. And this will probably still be faster, I hope, than the more sort of naive approach of just looping of everything. I don't know if you can see them moving. Let me make them jitter a little bit more than that. Yeah, right, like, the idea is that the garbage collector just handles it for you, but especially, okay, especially if you ever want to do any game or interactive thing in Java, um, you really need to care about garbage collection because, okay, the biggest impact I've found is that when the garbage collection happens, the audio will hitch, and that's because whatever thread you have, which is, like, pumping audio stuff to the sound card, it cannot really stand a couple of milliseconds of being stalled out because then you get too far behind and there's like a stutter in the audio which is kind of pretty like really noticeable like a little frame rate hitch you can normally deal with but if the audio also hitches that's real bad so if you want to write a game in java you essentially have to avoid ever allocating anything like you know if i'm doing all of these calculations and like constructing lists of these results so like in here for example every time i do a query i construct a list of candidates and then like return that. If I wanted to optimize this, I would have the list as like 
a member variable and like always reuse the same list or something like that because if this gets called 2000 times per frame then allocating 2000 lists is going to build up a load of garbage and eventually that's going to cause a gc thing sorry for anyone who's not familiar with java and garbage collection this is probably way too technical but these are the kind of things you have to be concerned about basically cache everything like reuse collections and clear them out and reuse them like pool stuff you, you just cannot allocate thousands of things per frame basically handmade hero okay that's casey moratori's thing right i have watched a couple of those i'm kind of a fan of his whole ethos and i've watched some of his lectures and stuff i think he's a pretty pretty smart guy um <laughs> yeah and there's there's so many hundreds of hours i haven't really watched still but i do kind of vaguely follow what he does and yeah, I've got a lot of respect for for Casey. I mean, he probably wouldn't approve of me using a Java-based <laughs> framework for this, right? Okay. So right now it seems a bit slower to use this core tree, but again, I'm sure there would be some some point where it becomes uh, faster, or I've got some like horrible bug in here and this is this demo is not going to turn out in my favor okay <laughs> also apologies if i'm screwing up the stream's frame rate by doing this okay that's interesting yeah and there are really really good profiling tools for JVM which will let you see like heat maps of all the allocations like what types of things are allocated what types of things are garbage collected where specifically they are allocated um so even though it can get pretty complicated it there are like really really good tools out there which is why JVM is is kind of nice um yeah even though my last demo failed to <laughs> demonstrate that the quad tree was relatively performant this is a bit more representative of what you'll actually do, which is if stuff is moving around the world, you'll just reconstruct this quad tree every, uh, every time. Um, yeah, but you know what? I think I will probably leave it here for today. Um, if you don't know, we are Stray Basilisk. We're an indie game dev studio working on our project called Steam Pounds, which is a turn-based tactical game, which I will shamelessly plug right now even though I can't spell its name. Yeah, so you can kind of check us out on Steam. We have this cool turn-based tactics, pixel arty, steampunky thing going on. Uh, if you're interested, you can check that out, and I'm going to drop the link into the chat. Otherwise, you can find us on Twitter. Where we, we normally post a poll every week before this stream to... Awesome! CGM, thanks so much. We really appreciate that. And it's going to look even more awesome. There is very cool stuff and basically complete visual overhaul in the works. So, yeah, we're kind of excited about where it's going. It is pretty cool, Andrew. <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so every normally every Thursday on Twitter, we'll post a poll about what topic, what little project we want to do on the coding stream. Quadtree happened to be voted up this week, but we've had all sorts of stuff like we'll make a little game or we'll make a little graphical effect or a shader or something in unity or something in we made a discord bot in go like all of this kind of cool stuff so every week it's kind of something new we also have a discord um where you can get involved in the free kind of open playtest steam hounds so we regularly run we do a live stream where we kind of play steam hounds with the community every other week uh, also a new patch coming out every other week. Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks so much also um, Piggy Bank for the raid, and anyone who's followed off us, and anyone who's followed us off the back of that, that's that's really super, super appreciated, and I'll be sure to check out what you guys are all up to as well. So, yeah, thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed this, and hopefully we'll catch you uh, next week. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>